Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number four of Coffee and Issues. My name is Carol Bernard, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Mr. Michael Lejeune. Hey, Mike. Hello, everybody. How's it going today? It's going awesome, man. All right. Awesome. You know me. Hey, we've got a really great topic for today. And just as a reminder, it, you're joining us for the first episode. All of our episodes, what we're trying to do with this podcast slash videocast is take things into a logical sequence of issues that crop up for people as they navigate their GovCon journey all the way from starting from the beginning and then all the way through. So it's going to be interesting to see how many episodes we ultimately end up with, but there's a lot of issues. So I'm guessing we're going to have a lot of episodes. And today's episode, we're going to talk about, and this is an episode that a lot of people are running up against early in the beginning. I've seen this a lot of times. I've probably worked with directly over a, a thousand contractors over the span of my career inside of the government marketplace, which I just realized I just hit the 20 year mark in that. And that's just, it's getting crazy. Old. What happens <laughs> yeah. when you get old, man? Yeah, I am, man. So, but getting more wise as I go along too. <laughs> so, so that's the plan. Maybe. So. I don't know. My kid doesn't think so. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. So Mike, the issue that we're going to talk about today is you're in it for the wrong reason. And I want to talk about why folks are in it for the wrong reasons. I mean, there could be a lot of reasons, but there's two main ones that I've got today. And wrong reason number one is because you have a certification. Wrong reason number two, as I see it, is, is because it's all about the money. Maybe you heard that the government right. marketplace is the world's largest buyer and you want a piece of that action and you want to put yourself somewhere in the middle of That's a right. transaction. So, Mike, do, do you have any other wrong reasons maybe that we should address? And we'll, we'll go through each one of these, but is there anything that you want to talk about? We could probably come up with a handful, but I think those two are some of the primary reasons. I'll throw out a third one. It's you've got some friend whose cousins, other friends, like there's this long string of people and then somebody said, you know what? I heard this is a good thing to do. And you're like, yeah. really? Somebody you didn't even know said, Hey, you could start a woman owned business and you could just rake in all kind of money. This is going to yeah. be easy because you got some bad advice from a third party yeah. that guess what isn't even in the market. Yeah. And I think that also kind of circles back to kind of that first aspect of, yeah. of wrong reason number one, because you have a certification, whether that's you know veteran owned or, or women owned or a minority owned business. And this can apply equally both in the federal government marketplace as well as state and local. And I think that the issue with this that I've seen is, is a couple one. So as I just mentioned, literally, I've probably worked with a thousand businesses at this point, but I've seen this quite common where somebody comes in and they say, hey, my wife is a woman, of course, and <laughs> I want to put the, the business in my wife's name. Yeah. Okay. And maybe they already have a, a separate business that's doing well, a separate small business that's doing well, but I want to put it in my wife's name. Or they might say, well, hey, minority business certification 8A is where it's at. So we want to stand up a separate company to basically, I've got a friend that is a minority individual and they could get that certification and we could do this. Now, I would say that that's in most instances, now it's probably happened and there's been an exception where it has been successful, but I would think that it's more of the exception than rather the rule because of so many reasons that we really don't have time to get into with regards to ownership and not only ownership, yeah. but control of the company. And that's what trips up most people. It's easy to say, hey, 51%, we could put it over there. We could qualify for all of these things. But what a lot of people don't realize early in the game is that the government looks very closely at the control of the business and they're trying to get folks to not set up essentially what's called a pass through where it's just like, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, you are a veteran and you're going to put yourself in the middle of the mix here where a corporation that does not have the status is going to use you to go through you and get contracts and the government doesn't want that. Right. Do you have any specific things you want to say typically about that wrong reason, number one, and, and what you have seen in terms of that? Yeah. So not only what you're talking about there, but the other thing that I see a lot, and this comes up almost every single time I'm talking to a company. So you'll be surprised how often this happens. I'll get a phone call and it's from a guy 
And the guy says, my wife is certified WSB, blah, blah, blah. And so I would say, well, where is she? Well, she's not super involved in the business. Well, then you're not a WSB. Right. Or fill in the blank, whatever the thing is. I'm like, well, where is that person? Oh, they're not super involved. And so I'm like, well, then technically you really shouldn't qualify for this thing, but you have put them in charge because you think it's okay. And they do have that ownership and all those kind of things. And so when I'm talking to people, one of the first things I always tell them is, I am not in good conscience going to help you chase contracts if you out of the gate aren't even following the rules here. Let's get the rules in line. Go get the W. Let's get her on the phone. And she's going to be in charge. She needs to be in on this decision. And you need to restructure the way you're doing some stuff. So that's a conversation I have a lot with people is, We've got to get that right out of the gate. You know, that's one of those things before we even get into a lot of the other pieces. But it's sort of as you get into the, the other points here about the money and all these other things, it's like, I hate to kind of keep going back to this thing because I know a lot of people are probably tired of hearing me say it all the time. But you've got to find out if the government is buying what you sell, right? And you got to find out how they're buying it. You got to find out if it makes sense for you and, and all those little things. But also, like if you're getting in the market, I had a conversation with a lady today. She was getting in the market and she had no background in the things she wanted to sell, like zero background in it. And so I won't say exactly what she did for her corporate life, but I was like, so what did you do? And she throws out like window washing. Let's just say that she throws out window washing. And I'm like, yeah. well, what does your husband do? And she's like, well, he's also a window washer. I'm like, then why do you want to sell cybersecurity? Because I heard it was a good thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you have no background in the product or service you're selling. You've never owned a business before, and you don't know anything about the government. Those are three strikes against you right out of the gate in this scenario here. Because again, you don't know anything about what you're doing. It's not that you can't be successful, but you have set yourself up for losing in this situation because you don't know anything about the service. The learning curve on all of yep. those things is so high now. So when I'm looking at that, how do you correct this problem? Okay, the government does buy window washing. Have you ever thought about selling that? No, we didn't think about selling. You have a background in window washing. You know all about it. Let's have a conversation about that instead yeah. of cybersecurity. And in their situation, I also said, hey, I just happened to run the numbers yesterday. And in the service you're trying to sell, I actually ran the numbers and the WSB certification is going to provide you zero value, mm -hmm. zero value. Because out of all of the money being spent in there, I think it was like 4% was going to WSBs last year. But if you shifted the service over to window washing, then guess what? 35% of that money was going to WSB. So now your WSB is going to be more relevant. So there's little things like that where they were going to go chase this rabbit. Yeah. I'm like, and you're never going to catch it. And you're going to be really frustrated because you jumped in and made this mistake. And for anybody out there that's kind of starting a business, I was actually asked this question the other day from a random person, not through the Gavology or anything, but they knew I was an entrepreneur and they were like, hey, what do you think is a good business that I could launch right now? What's happening? What's popular? You know, and yeah. I had to pause and think about that. And then I came back and what I believe is true is that think back on your career. Think back of all the things that you've done in your career and the experience that you draw from. Where were there gaps? Where were the challenges? Because if you can really go and see these gaps that probably exist across the board and these challenges that exist for across the board, both for commercial and for government, and you can really figure out how to legitimately and truthfully put solutions to those things, that's when you have a good business, in my opinion. No, I agree. So yeah, thanks for that, man. I mean, it just kind of sparked that thought. Also, veterans uh, coming out, you know, you can go right into government contracting, but go back to your military career. I'm sure that there were a mm -hmm. lot of challenges you probably found from that instead of getting out. And just like Michael was saying, going into IT or construction, obviously there's a lot of spend in, in government construction. And right. sometimes if people are just looking at the dollars, these millions of dollars in construction, they might go want to get involved with that. But even as a startup, man, if you can get like $5,000 here and there, that can start your business and, and 
be the seeds of your yeah. success and, and you can build up from there. And what you said there is so important about leaning on your experience at some level, just because again, there's so many learning curves. Why add more? And why add more learning curves to what you're doing? So if you can take something you already know and build on it, you're going to do this much faster. It's going to be much easier. And then you're at least going to be an expert somewhere in this business. And I think that is a real difference maker with your confidence, with how you pursue all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And when you don't know anything about it, that's really hard. And that was actually what you said earlier. That was my number one question of 2020 was, hey, Mike, if I was just starting a business today, what industry would you select? Like I was asked that more times in 2020 than I've probably been asked the last 15 years combined because there was all these entrepreneurs starting companies last year, yeah. whether they were out of work or they're working from home and they've got all this time on their hands. They're like, hey, I'm gonna start a side gig or whatever, right? And so a lot of that was going on. And in every single one of those cases, I gave similar advice. I'm like, well, what do you know? I'm like, well, I could do this or I could do this. Okay, well, which one are you passionate about? Okay, well, which one do you have contacts with? Okay, hey, let's go look at the data and figure out which one your status would be more helpful to, given the customer you want to focus on. And so there's just a few little things like that. Now, all of a sudden, you've got more of a picture put together, and you can make an educated decision on going left, going right. Or one of the decisions that I coach people to a lot is, hey, let's just stop and let's not get into government because this is going to be a real headache. And let's pursue something else that's a passion of yours or stay in the commercial market. Again, those are all valid options. But for some reason, the government market is a really attractive option a lot of times mm -hmm. because a lot of people make it out to be this very simple thing, which I do believe it's simple, but it takes a little bit yeah. of time to learn it. Yeah. So. And I, I mean, at some levels, it could be simple and some levels, it could be super complex and challenging. That's a different topic, but don't bite off sometimes more than you can chew inside of this world. But I wanted to make a second point because we talked about the wrong reason to, for being in. You're in it for the wrong reason. Number one being like, because you have a certification or know somebody who has a certification, even if you carry the certification legitimately, I think that people, if they are only like looking at their certification as their point of value, they get a lot of frustration. And actually, we did have an issue that was submitted on this topic and I had to think about this one for a while. And I don't know this person's situation, but one of the things that they shared with me is that a lot of prime contractors like basically will use the WOSB or their DBE certification, bring them in as a sub to say, hey, we're doing our part to provide credit or right. goals, their scolding program. We're doing our part. But then what happens is that she's not getting the contract after the bid happens. So basically right. what? Not getting any work. Right. So what she was saying was that they're kind of using her certification to say that they're going to meet the goals, but then they're hiring a person that's not a woman-owned small business. And again, I don't know her situation, but I did want to speak to some points on this because this is a lot of frustration a good one. for a lot of people. So number one thing I'm going to say is that certification can open doors for you and it can help to level the playing field so you're not competing against these big companies. But at the end of the day, it won't get you a contract. And I had to think about that truth in that statement. I say, like, well, is that true? And then I said, well, maybe there's an exception with regards to if somebody's getting an 8A sole source contract, right? Because like 8A sole source, you got the contract. If you didn't have the 8A certification, you wouldn't have got the sole source contract. But even then, just because you're an 8A company and an agency reaches out to you to give you a sole source contract, it's not automatic. Right. You still have to basically give them a proposal. They still have to do their review there's still a negotiation that happens. They still have to ensure that prices are fair and reasonable. So there's still a process. So the certification will help to open the door for you to get there and may give you some advantages. But at the end of the day, it won't get you a contract. And I think this is the frustration that I was feeling from this person because they were frustrated that because they had this certification that they weren't getting their contract. The other yeah. thing that I will say is, in most cases, goals are not mandates. And the government 
really doesn't get all that much involved with the prime sub relationships. Right. So if a prime contractor says, yeah, we're going to look to all of the people that are subcontracting under us to see where we can get utilization. If at the end of the day, there's your proposal and then there's another proposal and they're looking at the two together, they might think to say, well, we're not going to go with this one, even though she's got the certification or he's got the certification because this is a better value for us. Right. And we can get our goaling from a different subcontractor over here. So I think people get upset because they don't really understand how that kind of the interworkings happen and they, they feel like they're getting ripped off sometimes because of that. So Mike, do you want to kind of lend some words to just that aspect of things? Yeah, this is a deep topic here. So first of all, if you believe that your value is your status, you've already lost. You've already lost. There's a couple of points I'm going to make that are going to hit to somebody's soul here in a moment. And you may not like me, but these are the truth you, you need to hear. If you walk into an organization and the first thing out of your mouth is we're a WSB, we're an A-Day, we're an SDVSB, we're a fill in the alphabet soup, whatever it is, they're going to roll their eyes and go, oh, these people have no idea what they're doing. And they're like the other 5,000 companies that have come through our doors, no clue what they're doing. So you've got to learn how to communicate the value you provide and not lean on your status. That's why almost, I don't want to say every, but a ton of people who graduate 8A nosedive right after the program because they've leaned on their 8A so hard, they have never figured out how to communicate the value they actually yeah. provide to the customer. So that's one of the things. The other thing here is people need to understand there is actually zero, zero accountability for meeting those goals. I've never seen anybody lose their job, get fired, whatever, because they missed their SBA goals. I haven't seen it in my career. There's just not any accountability. So they're not forced to do it. They've got to make the right decision for the government. And sometimes it's not you. And then let's get into why that woman may have lost after being on a winning contract. It's not specific to her. This happens to tons of people. But a lot of times it starts with the first piece of documentation you should put together that no one ever does. And that's their teaming agreement. Most people, if they do a teaming agreement, it's a couple of pages long. It's not in depth. And guess what? They typically go on percentage of work. So, hey, we want 39, 40%, whatever percentage of work. And it's so hard to actually zero in on a percentage of work. Oh, we'll get to that. We'll get to you. We're going to put these few bodies in place first, then we'll get to you. You'll hear that kind of thing. And what you need to do is zero in on task areas. So almost every contract I see has specific task areas. So in your teaming agreement, you need to focus on it and say, hey, we're going to chase this contract. There's 11 task areas in it. We want to focus on these two. So anytime the contracting officer requests these two services or this product, or whatever, that's us. We get all of that and make it very, very clear in your teaming agreement what you're supposed to do. The other thing is, let's say you've been approached by the prime, they need you to work on this proposal for this opportunity, and then the proposal team rolls around for a meeting, you don't show up, you cancel this, that, and the other. Your inactivity or activity level during the proposal phase will often determine how much work you get. So let's say there's five companies on my team and three of them show up for every meeting. They're in the red team. They're helping me write stuff. They're super active. If something happens, I'm going to award, or if we win this thing, I'm going to award them pieces of this project because all along the way, they've been participating. They've been playing the game and you have it. And so that's what I see a lot of times is people don't put stuff in their teaming agreement. They don't participate fully in the proposal phase. And they're not super responsive to the prime. And then it gets awarded and they're like, where's my money? Well, where were you when we needed you? Yeah. Uh, and, and so if, if you're acting this way on the front end, how are you going to support the customer? And so a lot of people won't say, well, you kind of stunk all through the process. Therefore, we don't want to give you any work. They're not going to tell you that for the most part. They're just not going to give you any work. And so if you look at the process that I just outlined there from the upfront piece all the way through this, that's some of the reasons why I see these people not get any work. 
I think that's some of the primary stuff yeah. that if you fix, you'll start getting the work. Yeah. And to just piggyback off of kind of what you said here, I think this is going to be a, just a good summary here for if we're telling you don't make it all about your certifications, then what do you make it out of? And, and Mike alluded to that, which, which is your value. So go back to your value. And I would say, to be honest, when you're selling, just put the certifications aside. Act like you don't even have them. What if you didn't have the certifications? Mm -hmm. How would you win that business? Because I really believe that the best businesses winning in the government marketplace they could basically go after head to head with anybody, regardless mm -hmm. of certification. And we see this. I mean, I've got people that I help. See it it's all great the time. to see. Like when you've got a small women owned business who's going head to head in full and open competitions that are not set aside and winning against big companies. It's just like, I love to see that. And I think that that's the best. The other like problem that it presents when people start to get really agitated that they're not getting a contract because of their certification is that one, as we mentioned, they're not understanding the process, but when they start to go to complain about it to different people, we also have to remember that business typically happens with people that the person that you want to do business with knows, likes, and trust. And I would always ask you to think about that. How well do they know us? How well do they like us? And how well do they trust us? And you got to have all three. And if all three aren't yeah. there, you're going to have a hard time winning business. Obviously, you want them to know you in a favorable way, but they could also know you in a non-favorable right. way. And I know that when I was a contracting officer at the VA, there was some internal conversations that would happen with some contractors from our facilities folks. And I was in construction and they were like, well, I hope that person doesn't win. And you don't want to yeah. be that person. Yeah. You don't want to be wrapped up with that person for months and years. I had somebody today that was complaining about a rating they got. And I said, go ahead and make your case, make it very politely. We gave him some instructions. And then the, the contracting officer came back and said, well, you didn't do all these things. And I'm like, well, I still want to go fight this and get a better rating. And I'm like, stop, you've got to stop. At this point, you actually got a better rating than you deserved. And you're trying to get even better. All you're going to do is irritate them. And now that's going to be how they remember you is you're extremely difficult when you didn't even do your job. Yeah. And so like, we don't think about all those kind of things, but they really do matter. The other point that you were making there about no liking and trusting you, when you're just coming in, you have zero past performance. You haven't mapped anything from your corporate career. And so you literally, all you have is a status initially. That's what you have. You've got to work with partners. You're not going to necessarily be a prime out of the gate. You might hit something and be lucky if you knew a contracting officer in your government life. And then they said, hey, if you started a business, we'd give you some work. That might happen. But a lot of times you've got to humble yourself, get some really good teaming partners and build your past performance. And so a lot of people are trying to jump the steps here. And yeah. that's what causes them to get so frustrated. Like, why can't I win a $50 million project? Have you ever even done a $1 million project? No, yeah. you don't have the capacity. You to know. do a $50 million project. Or the experience. Yeah, or the experience. We've got to learn right. these things. And so that's where a lot of times we just got to slow down, walk before we run. And next thing you know, you'll be winning and hitting it out of the park, but you just got to slow down. There's a couple of things here I want to mention, and I think then we can close out this whole topic and this whole issue for the day and just kind of wrap it up. But basically what you just said is so relevant. And I would go back to one solution here. So if you're not winning the contracts, right, either if, if it's with a government agency or with a prime contractor, rather than like kind of complain about it and, and just agitate people, go back and ask them, well, hey, what was it? And, and we talk about this debriefing mm -hmm. process. What was it that was maybe not in my proposal that you didn't see or, or try to find out the facts, the truths of yeah. why you didn't win. Then if, if somebody is open yeah. enough to you to basically share that with you, take it in, think about it, say, well, is this true? Is, is my prices 15 to 20% higher than the person without the certification? And what can I do to then go in and fix my pricing so that I can incrementally get better and become a more value-based contractor to these contractors that I'm yeah. proposing to or to the government? 
So I think that that wraps it up. We also talked about wrong reason number two, which is the fact that the government's the world's largest buyer, and that's why you're in, and you would just want to put yourself in the middle. All about the money. Right. But as we said, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that one. But really, at the end of the day, the government really has made some efforts. Unless there's a true value add that you're providing as a middleman or as a reseller, the government doesn't really want to have to go through a middleman because they really don't have to, really. Right? Right. Right. There's some instances where that could be argued. You could debate this particular topic on a value-added reseller adding value. I believe that there's a lot of people who are distributors and resellers that do add value to the manufacturers that they represent. But at the end of the day, if like you know somebody who makes tractor tires and you're a veteran and the VA buys tractor tires, now you're going to basically set something up. You're still working your full-time job, but you're going to set this up watch for opportunities and just basically be a transaction guy. It doesn't work that way. I've seen people try to do it, fail miserably, but it's partly because there's a lot of rules around all of this that we really don't have the time to go into inside of this episode. But the more you get educated and knowledgeable about what does ownership and control of your company mean and, and having a dedicated effort into your business and having the highest officer position inside of the company, then you start to realize why a lot of these things that might be pretty creative just won't work for you inside of the government marketplace. Yep. No, great advice. All right. Well, let me look at uh, my notes here. So I think we, we covered everything. Just as a recap, remember, ask yourself, how well do they know you like you and trust you? When you're selling, forget about your certifications for a second and focus on why your business is not winning the contracts. Remember that goals are not mandates, right? So nobody's mandated to do business with you. And so I think that that's always going to be a losing battle that somebody's going to be trying to fight. Remember that the best businesses in the government marketplace are those that don't really need the certifications, especially the small businesses. You know, if you could really stand alone on your value, go ahead ahead with anybody, that's when you've got a great business and that's when you're going to really take off. So Mike, do you have any last words in closing today? You know, I think you did a great summary there. I think these have all been great episodes. And so uh, if you're tuning in, be sure and submit questions on the website, show up live, submit questions in the after show and thank everybody for tuning in. With that, Michael, thank you again for being with us and we'll close episode four and we'll see you on the next show. Take care, everyone. Let's go ahead and go to questions. We can I don't talk see about. any in the chat, but I don't know if you have any that were submitted before then. So just so everybody knows, I mean, we can talk about the topic from today. So if you've got questions about that, we can also talk about something else. I mean, you've got us here for another 20 minutes or so. So we're happy to just yeah. field any question about government contracting that you could think of. So anything's on the table. There's some really good comments. Um, There's one that I'd like to say, and that is, uh, she says, as a woman, I have asked to meet the woman in charge at a very small WOSB and 8A, and they respond with, oh, she's not involved like that. So yeah, that goes back to your point. All um, the time. It shouldn't be that way. And contracting with the sovereign is certainly different than commercial. Your commercial contracting partner cannot call the inspector general of the FBI to investigate you. It's an interesting market. And there's a lot of what I would call like self-governing going on where people are trying to make sure that we're in compliance. And then every now and then someone on the outside is asking about compliance. So here's a question that just came in. It says, what advice are you giving companies regarding COVID vaccination for doing on-site government work? I'll start it out. I mean, just get the facts about what it is. I saw a wonderful post that was put out by your partner, Josh Frank on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I would actually recommend that you guys connect with both Michael Lejeune, as well as Josh Frank, if you're not already connected with those two gentlemen on LinkedIn and read the article because Josh gave some wonderful advice. And I mean, all you can do is really, it is what it is at the end of the day, regardless of your political stance on things or whatever you feel or believe. I mean, if they're requiring it, I'm not sure if there's any recourse to to not comply. I've done quite a bit of research on this and I have, again, regardless of political beliefs, I've seen a few organizations, and this is my interpretation of what's going on, try to bully people into forcing their employees to get vaccinated, which I don't think is the right way to go here. When I read through the actual 
mandates, if you will, it's interesting to me because they're not vaccine mandates. It's really protocols for dealing with COVID and the vaccine gives you some leeway. But if people choose not to get vaccinated, there's protocols for them. And the main one is weekly testing. And some organizations will require up to twice a week to be tested if you are not vaccinated. And then there's protocols on site for if you're unvaccinated, then you know, you're know you probably wearing a mask, you're at least six feet apart. All those kind of things are required. So it's a little deceptive to me when I hear vaccine mandate and then I read it and it says, if you're vaccinated, then do A, but if you're not right. vaccinated, do B. I'm right. like, so is it a mandate or not? I'm like, yeah. oh, it's really not. Yeah. And so in a lot of cases, it is not required. There's other things, other protocols you'll have to follow. So look at those. And then you've got at state level. So there's the federal and at the state level, there's different requirements. So depending on what state you're in, you may have a different letter that comes in from the state that yeah. says, hey, in addition to X, Y, Z, we want you to do this or that, mm -hmm. or there's no restrictions, whatever it may be. So just make sure whatever state you're in, you're looking at both the federal and state documentation, and you're following those guidelines, whether people want to get vaccinated or not, there's ways for them to continue to work. I have yet to see a scenario where somebody chooses to not get vaccinated and the guidelines say, well, you must fire that person. I have not seen that. I have seen organizations say, hey, somebody's not getting vaccinated and you're no longer going to be employed here. I have seen that, but I have not seen it from the state or federal level. Even when I looked at the nursing mandates and all those, we have relatives that are nurses and I was like, hey, I do government stuff. Let me review this yeah. stuff for you. And it said, here are the exemptions. Yeah. So, and you meet actually two of the exemptions, two of the three. So you don't have to get the vaccine. Here is how you file that paperwork and move forward with that. Mm -hmm.